how do you make connections and help young truth seekers have context so that they know that the facts they have are actually true? We are going to explore this and so much more with nonfiction storyteller extraordinaire Candace Fleming. Candace Fleming is the author of more than 40 books. Among her nonfiction titles are Giant Squid, Amelia Lost, The Life and Disappearance of Amelia Earhart, and The Family Romanoff, Murder, Rebellion, and The Fall of Imperial Russia. Most recently, she's published The Rise and Fall of Charles Lindbergh, which won the 2021 Yalsa Excellence in Nonfiction, and Honeybee, The Busy Life of Apis Mellifera, the winner of the 2021 Siebert Medal. She also just recently published Crash from Outer Space, which we're going to talk about, and there's an upcoming Polar Bears, which I'm really excited about. Candace is the recipient of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Orbis Pictus Award, and a two-time recipient of the Boston Globe Horn Book Award for Nonfiction, the ALA Siebert Honor, and SCBWI's Golden Kite Award. We are going to have such a great time talking truth, fiction, and everything in between with Candace Fleming. Wonder, curiosity, connection. Where will your adventures take you? I'm Dr. Diane, and thank you for joining me on today's episode of Adventures in Learning. So welcome to the Adventures in Learning podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Diane, and we are so fortunate to have uh, renowned author Candace Fleming with us today. Welcome, Candy. I'm looking forward to talking to you today. Oh, thanks, Dr. Diane. I'm excited to be here. So um, I guess the first thing I want to talk about is you have written so many books. I mean, you've covered the gamut from picture books to history with um, Amelia Earhart, Charles Lindbergh, to science with The Honeybee and Giant Squid. How do, how do you move across that wide breadth in children's literature? Um, I always joke and say, um, you know, that it's my short attention span um, that, you know, sort of allows me to do all those different things. Um, I'm not sure if it's necessarily like the super ability that I have to move from YA nonfiction to, you know, preschool fiction. Um, I think really it's about what I'm curious about and what I feel like I want to write. And then I think about who I think would be the most receptive audience for those particular books. Um, I'm thinking about, um, for instance, Bulldozer's Big Day. Um, Here I was in the middle of working on the family Romanoff, which was sort of a dark and very lengthy, um, really complicated process, really complicated project. And I really just needed some escape. And so I went for a walk and I watched Um, a couple of little boys with their mother watching construction trucks in the neighborhood. And I thought, that's exactly what I need. I need to spend a little time with little boys and construction trucks. So I actually came home and it was almost sort of a relief. Um, So I do that a lot. I'll be working in this big complex project. um, And at the same time, I'll be working on a little bit of preschool. So for me, it's left brain, right brain, and it provides balance. I couldn't, I don't think I could write YA nonfiction nonstop all the time. That makes sense. And I love the idea of the balance. Um, Mm -hmm. I've been following your books for years and I realized that so many of the things you write about are also things that I obsessed about or was curious (laughs) about, which may be why I love following you. Um, What inspires you for doing things as diverse as say the Romanoffs and Charles Lindbergh? Um, you know what? Here's the thing. And I love that you said that because I'm you're writing about stuff that I was really interested in, you know, when I was in middle school or high school. I've sort of started doing that um seriously and and um consciously been picking topics that I, of course, I have to be really interested in the topic, first of all, because those projects take two, three, four, sometimes five years. Um, but I've been consciously picking projects that I was fascinated by when I was in middle school and high school. And I don't think readers have changed a whole lot since then. I also think that middle school and high school might have a lot of facts to hand that I didn't have, say, when I was obsessing about, oh, say, like the Lindbergh kidnapping. Um, I didn't have that um, device in my hand that I could just click, click, click and find some facts. But here's what I think about nonfiction in the 21st century. The reason I write for middle school and non or middle school and high school nonfiction is because I think they have plenty of facts to hand 
but they don't have any context. And I also think that that is an age group that are seeking facts. They are looking, actively looking. They are truth seekers. And so um, I thought to myself, I know that they are looking and they are thinking about these very same ideas that I was when I was middle school and high school. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to pluck those ideas one, selfishly, so that I can um, delve more deeply into it and examine it myself um, and investigate. And two, because I think they'll appreciate the investigation. Um, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I was thinking over the last 10 years or so, um, I know that Google and the cell phone and all of that, just from what I've seen as a teacher, we have the facts. They don't necessarily need us for this is the fact, but what mm -hmm. I'm finding kids do need is to have us help them build the connections right. to figure out how do these things connect and how do you know what's true and what isn't? Right. How, how can you work through all of this stuff that's out there on the internet? Right. How can you work through it? Um, and, and I think even, even more importantly with history, why is it important? You know, what does, because I never pick a piece of history that I'm just going to chronicle it because I think kids should know about Charles Lindbergh. That would be, I think, um, a waste of everybody's time. Um, what I always think about in terms of those nonfiction stories that I bring to those readers, uh, I ask myself, what does this piece of history have to say with how do we, you know, how, what does this piece of history have to say with to how we live today? Um, what echoes, what hooks, um, what can we see about ourselves in the present day that can be found? What can we find about ourselves in the present day that can be found in those stories from the past? Um, and so that's another reason why I pick certain stories and why I choose to tell them, I think, the way that I do. I think it's interesting that you talked about uh, how can we help kids? How can kids know they have all the facts to hand, but how do they know which are the correct facts or which is the right information or how to how to connect that to the base of information that they already have so that they can think about that in deeper ways? Um, and I have a book and, and I know it's sort of a surprising um, book for me. And it just came out. It's called Crash from Outer Space. And it's for solidly middle school students. Um, but while it supposedly looks at flying saucers and alien life and that whole conspiracy that we've heard about for the past 30, 50 years, I don't know now, right. about Roswell, um, um, while it looks sort of like an examination of that, in truth, it's what it's really about is why do we believe conspiracy theories? Why do we believe um, extraordinary claims without any extraordinary evidence? And how do we go about determining what's truth and what's not? Um, and that's what that book is really about. So it's really a, like a gigantic question mark. I laughed. I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I've just given kid, kids 160 pages of questions. Um, but it's that it was really important to me to talk about the critical thinking process in terms of a subject that I thought they would be fascinated by, which is, of course, flying saucers and, you know, alien life. And that sounds like a really powerful book for our times, especially when you think about all of the conspiracy theories that are out there. Right, right. And in this way, like I said, it's palatable, right? So Absolutely. they go in, in in something they're naturally interested in, I think, and I was too. Yeah, of course. Um, at, at that age. And yet then they really get to look at that evidence and really ask some serious questions. Um, is it true? Is it not? And I think it's fascinating. Um, all of a sudden it has real connections. I mean, certainly has connections to conspiracy theories and, and our problem anymore with determining what is truth what is good evidence? Um, what is a good verifiable source? What is really a witness, right? We right. don't quite seem to even understand that anymore. Um, but if, interestingly, suddenly I've noticed all these things in the newspaper or I've heard on the radio, um, like NASA is suddenly formed a group. They did it just last week to investigate what the U.S. government is now calling UAPs instead of UFOs. So suddenly it's become relevant news-wise as well, which is interesting. You know, well, and I'd like to get your book and give it to a bunch of grownups I know as well. Yeah, yeah. And there actually is. I'm I literally on it, you know, one of the, I think like page, what do I think it's 181? I think some kid just told me that. <laughs> um, seriously, last week. Um, 
that there's actually what I call my thinking kids toolbox, where there's a list of six things to ask, to ask those people who are making those claims, six things to look for. Um, Those are some great skills. And I'd love to throw that into the show notes so people can read it. So check it out if you're reading it. Um, So as you're writing your nonfiction, like with history, one of the things I love about the way you write is that you make it feel like a story. It's engaging. It's not just dry facts. How do you structure your books to keep your readers engaged, yet still provide them with the confidence that what they're reading is factual? Oh, I love that you asked that. Um, I have strived really hard. So I'm writing narrative nonfiction or what some people call creative nonfiction, although sometimes people get that confused and they think creative nonfiction means that you created facts or situations or scenes. And that's no creative means that you've presented the information in a creative way um, as opposed to an encyclopedia. Um Here's the thing. Um, I do a lot of research, first of all, and so um, a lot of research. And I gather up a lot of details and a lot of descriptions and a lot of (sighs) minutia, I guess, is what some people would say when I'm doing research, which means that I'm going to research some of those stories three, four, five years, right? Which is another reason to be writing something short at the same time. Of course. Um, And um, what I do is I gather up all that information. And then I began to think about my story in terms of scene, just like a nonfiction or just like a fiction writer would. So I think about it in terms of scene. What's an important scene? What's the next important scene from beginning to the end? Um, I also know the story that I'm trying to tell before I actually sit down and write it. And I actually call it my vital idea as opposed to theme. And it's that thing that we already talked about briefly. What do I have to say to readers of the 21st century with this particular piece of history? Um, And that helps determine the course of what goes in the book and what does not. Because, you know, you, you do research and you have so much and you'd like to share everything, right? Right. Um, But if it doesn't speak right to what my vital idea is, I don't include it. So and here's the deal. I never know what that vital idea is until I've done a bunch of research. And then the story sort of tells me how it wants to be told. Um, I'm really interested in people. I think people drive history. So I'm really interested in what they say, what their motivations are, what other people have said about them. Um, I really want kids to feel like that history is really, really close and that those are real life people, not people on pedestals, like we oftentimes get in history class, that these were people that made decisions perhaps someday, one day in their lives that affects you today. Um, and they made it because they had a bad, you know, their back was sore or they they had the stomach flu or they just had a fight with their wife or, I mean, they were people. Right. Yeah. Um, and th- Thinking in terms of all of that, that's sort of what I try to bring to those books. I also, for a very long time, have thought about nonfiction for middle grade and high school. As you can tell, I've had a lot of thoughts about (laughs) about nonfiction for middle grade. Um, But I've often thought um, that I wanted to write nonfiction in a way that would give them the exact same experience as when they read a novel so that they're going to fill in with their imagination. I'm going to give them as much of a setting as I possibly can without making anything up. Um, And so that they have that very same experience. So as they read along with the nonfiction writer, me, they are doing what they would do if they were writing, if they were reading fiction. So they're grappling with questions and they're grappling with moral issues and they're asking themselves, would I have made that choice? And the only way you can write that is to write it narratively like a novel. Um, you know, that said, there is, there's its limits to that. Um, for example, if I say somebody walked across the green carpet, they, that carpet better be green. Um, Nicholas Romanoff almost, I think in almost every scene he's smoking. I know that's true because I don't know how many firsthand accounts I had. He was a chain smoker. And they said the only time that he didn't smoke was when he was chewing food or sleeping. Um, so you can bet that he always had a cigarette during conversation. Exactly. Right? So you can add that. So it feels more, more, um, like a novel, but yeah, that's, that's the, that's the goal, really the goal. Have you ever, as you've been writing, ex- thought your vital idea was going to be one thing and then just had a huge shift as research developed? <sighs> All the time. It really does as research developed. And I, I think the perfect example is, um, 
um, the family Romanoff. And I went into that um, knowing that I was probably going to bust a couple of middle schoolers ideas of that, you know, that sort of fairy tale that we have, particularly about Anastasia. Right. Um, And I knew that that was probably going to happen, but Uh, So I wanted to go in and I thought my vital idea was simply to tell readers who this family really was and what really happened that led to um, that terrible tragedy in that basement. Okay, so I researched for years and years, seriously, and I have mm, no kidding. I have 16 pages of notes about Fabergé eggs because, Diane, I love them. They're beautiful and they're interesting and they're they're like this extravagant, amazing gift. I want one. Um, And then I went to Russia to do I was um, invited to go to the um, archives in Moscow. And so I went to Russia and I got the opportunity to follow sort of in the footsteps of the Romanovs. And I got to Sarkoselo, that um, imperial estate that they moved to. They left St. Petersburg and the seat of government and escaped to this um, place 15 miles away where no one could get into. It was this huge estate. Um, that had several palaces on it and they pick the small palace only 120 rooms and they move (laughs) in I know and no one can come to visit them unless they have an appointment which when you think about that is really an isolation from government and I thought that was like crazy here's Nicholas he's the head of his country but he doesn't want to be where everything is happening where his ministers are where's you know nothing the Duma he doesn't want to be there he wants to be far out in the country and I thought well that tells me a lot about him so I get there and what I had thought I knew he had isolated himself but I thought it was purely physical isolation. I get there and I discover that this palace that I thought must have been in the middle of this enormous imperial park, so no one could see them. I discover they've picked the palace right up against the gate, the that the perimeter, the perimeter fence. And right directly on the other side of that fence is the village. Um, not only that, they have picked rooms. On that side of the on that side of the palace, their personal rooms. So, which means every single day they could look out their windows and they could see their people. They could hear them talking. They could smell their food cooking. They could hear their babies crying, and it still didn't seem to make any difference to them. And I thought to myself, "Wow, this is um, not a physical isolation. This is a psychological isolation, and that is entirely different." And so then I actually stood there at the gates from the palace looking into this village. And I I realized that I could not tell this story about the Romanovs until I told a story, um, firsthand accounts of villagers, peasants, workers, um, revolutionary soldiers. I had to actually focus on the people that Nicholas was supposedly ruling, um, that I couldn't tell the story without it. And so that vital idea suddenly changed. It was, how did it happen? You know, the vital idea was, how did the Romanovs die? But suddenly the question is, what happens when a ruler doesn't pay attention to the needs of his people? What happens when a ruler isolates himself, puts faith above fact? What happens when a ruler um, and his ruling class own 97% of the wealth and they're one and a half percent of the population. And suddenly that changed. Um, so I had to do more research and sadly my 16 pages of Fabergé eggs, uh, I defy you to find a single mention of those eggs in the book. So um, it sounds like you need to write another book about Fabergé eggs. Maybe, but I can't figure out how that connects to readers. So, you know, it might just be for myself, right? And that's okay too. Yeah, that's okay too. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk some more with Candy Fleming about the world of nonfiction storytelling. Hey, early childhood and elementary school educators. Are you looking for a keynote speaker or professional development workshop that will knock the socks off your teachers? Look no further. Check out the offerings at drdianeadventures.com. We offer half and full day professional development workshops that will help you learn how to build connections between multicultural picture books, authentic STEAM experiences, and your curriculum. 
You'll explore strategies to get your students fully engaged and wanting to learn more, and you'll walk away with a new perspective on multicultural picture books, as well as strategies and ideas guaranteed to awaken your sense of wonder and to help you immediately build science and STEAM connections in your early childhood elementary or library setting. Learn how to connect science and math to literacy, oral communication, gross motor skills, and dramatic and artistic play. Every activity and strategy can be completed using materials you already have in your classroom, school, or home education setting. Check out the offerings at drdianeadventures.com. Welcome back to our conversation with author Candy Fleming. So if you could write about anybody right now, is there somebody sort of percolating at the back of your mind that you would love to spend some time with? I don't have anybody I'm percolating with right now. And I think that could be, I'm in the midst of a very, it's probably the hardest book I've ever written. And it's about Jonestown. Um, oh. And it's about um, um, the high schoolers, the high schoolers that um, sort of up and left. I mean, literally they were in this high school in San Francisco. And one day they, they refer to it as the Exodus. Um, one day there's 200 kids in the school. And basically next week there are, nope, there's all these empty chairs. Um, what happened to them? Um, who survived? Who did it? And why are they there in the first place? Um, so some of the people that I've spoken to, some of the survivors have, you know, every single one of them have basically said, we didn't join a cult, we joined a cause. And um, so that's something that I'm examining now. Um, and I think that simply because, you know, there's a bigger question of why do we, and, you know, we think about it on Facebook, we have we call our quote unquote followers. So why do, why do we follow certain people? What is that sort of personality that, that somebody can lead us to believe things that aren't true and to take actions that are um, everything we would not have ever done in our entire life. And what is that? Um, it's sort of a tough examination. And um, I'm trying not to use the word cult because I think that is it, it, it closes conversation because you all think everybody goes, oh, cult, those are Looney Tunes people. And they're really not, right? right. So all of it has become, if you looked at my, I'm looking around, you can see me looking around and go, oh my God, you should see my office right now. Um, and I haven't quite, as you can see, I haven't quite, gelled with that vital idea is but I think I'm close it sounds like a very difficult and timely book it, I know about timely but it's certainly difficult I, I think there's some timeliness too I mean when you talked about the Facebook connection and sort of the advent of social media I think that that cult of personality in terms of how we follow people and how we respond is an important question. Yeah, sure. You look at like TikTok, right? And um, so you have things like slap the teacher day and how many kids across the United States actually went ahead and did that. And you, and you know that in, in real life, those, those people, those young people are not like that at all. They would never probably. Right done that on their own. And yet there's something, something that is encouraging us all to act in ways that would be, and continue to act in ways that would not be in our natural best interests. Yeah. And in our best interest. Exactly. And Jonestown is the extreme example. It is the extreme, but sometimes looking at the extremes helps That's shed a exactly. light on where we are now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to shift out of history and move into the world of science for a few minutes. Right. Um, so I absolutely love honeybee and I love giant squid. I use them both um, in work I've done with kids. Um, I worked with the libraries this summer on some of their programs and we use giant squid to create um, and build structures that would allow us to get to the bottom of the sea to go exploring. And the museum I used to be at had a, um, observation hive. And so I got to go out and help tend the hive and tend the bees. And so I have lost my copy of Honeybee. Like I've literally have gone through three copies of your book because people keep taking it. It's that good. Um, gee, what a shame. <laughs> so I don't mind because people are reading, but what moved you to sort of explore those particular topics? 
I, you know, I'll, I'll be really honest with giant squid. That was not my idea. That was Eric's. Um, he wanted to, he was obsessed with giant squid and um, he actually had a book contract to do it. And he had a really hard time um, coming up with a text that he felt worked as a picture book. And so finally he came down to me. He, he, like he always says, oh gosh, what was I thinking? I had a nonfiction writer in the house and I should just utilize her. So he came down and um, he said, you know, look at this. And I said, yeah, it's, it's the, the text is a mess, but he already had some really amazing um, sketches for what he thought he was going to do with the book. Um, and so I took on the project for him and then I discovered when I did the research that I was absolutely fascinated by them myself. And what I found most interesting was the fact that we know nothing about them, that we share our world with hundreds of thousands of these creatures that some can grow to be the size of a school bus and we never see them. And I just, that just sort of blew me away that we could know more about the surface of Mars than a giant squid or know more about dinosaurs. Than, giant than a squid. giant squid. It's just crazy, isn't it? It and is. So I realized that sort of the vital idea for this book was how much we don't know about giant squid, that there's just so mysterious. Um, and that, that became uh, sort of the thing that I followed. Um, when I looked at science books at the time, um, I went and looked at science picture books and I'll be really honest, I did not like them because they were so often a fact and a page, mm -hmm. a nice picture, but a fact and a picture, turn the page, a fact and a picture, turn the page. And sometimes they might've had a lead, lead in, like imagine you are, mm -hmm, right? Right. It's still fact and picture. And um, I've always come from that picture book place where picture books are written for the musicality of the language, for it to sound beautiful when it's read out loud and for there to be some emotional heat to to it. And so often science books have no emotional heat. And I don't think that's the best way we can connect with readers, or at least that I can connect with my readers. So um, once I realized that it was the mystery that I wanted to, to kind of focus on, um, I decided to write this lyrical, mysterious, writhing sort of story. The language has got that atmospheric feel to it. And I remember I sent it to my, our editor, Neil Porter, and I said, um, I know this is not like anything that you have seen out there when it comes to science books, but I just, I just feel like I have to tell it this way. And of course he loved it and it did really well. And so we were asked to do a second book. And so we had um, done a big animal that nobody sees. So we thought we would do a little animal that everyone sees, a little creature, but maybe doesn't know anything about. And I remember when I told Neil, I picked the honeybee. He said, oh, that's a really important story. And it was so funny because I was immediately put off by that because I thought, oh, he's thinking about the fact that it's it's endangered, that it's so right. important how we live today, right? We can't live without honeybees. 70% of everything we eat is connected to their work. Um, but I thought to myself, this book is for third graders. And I don't think telling third graders those sorts of facts does anything that doesn't connect. And if I want kids to take some sort of action, I have to have to, again, emotional heat, right? I have to have that, that um, personal connection. I have to find something they can connect to. And I really believe that action requires empathy. And so I thought to myself, if I can get kids to fall in love with one B, um, they will love all bees. And so that's why suddenly I am, I'm ending up, I'm writing a biography of just one bee. And I discovered they have this amazing life. And I didn't even realize that in this 35 short days, they do all these, these tasks and they don't fly to the very, very end. And I thought, well, there's my tension, you know, um, I knew I had succeeded, um, right before COVID struck, I went to a Christian school in Texas and I got to share the book for the first time I'd shared it, um, third grade. The next day they went to their school. Um, they had a school worship service and um, every class was asked to ask, was asked to give something to pray for. And those third graders actually asked the rest of the school to pray for honeybees. Aww. And I thought, yes, you know, it worked um, even better. When during COVID, um, which was really when the book came out, um, and um, I would share it online with kids when we were Zooming and they're at home. 
And I had a group of third graders that I was sharing with. And the, as you know, the book is, no, she doesn't fly. No, she doesn't fly. No, she's stuck, stuck in this dark hive. And finally, when that part was, she's, and yes, she, she flies and she leaps out of the hive and then you turn the page and she's out in the sunshine and the sweetness of the flowers. And he actually had a third grader unmute himself and he goes, just like us, one day we'll leap out of our hives oh. and, we'll fly and all of his friends like unmute mute and they're like, yay. And I'm like, try not to cry. And I thought to myself, it's amazing. There's this alchemy. You never know what kids are going to find in your work. You never know what they're going to connect to. And I, I, who would have thought that honeybee would connect them to the possibility of there being a better world eventually, right? When they were st right. stuck in their little hives. So um, now we have polar bear. It won't oh. be out until <laughs> November. Wait, I might, do I have one hanging around? I had a copy here somewhere but my office is so off it awful um we've had a little printing delay so it was supposed to be out in october and now it's november and now i think it's the end of november and of course i don't see one but it is that same sort of idea so we're going to follow a mother and her two cubs from the day they step out of their den um to the day they return to the ice and it really is a story about their struggle um how important it is to have ice and how um, our warming climate, our warming world has made their life, which is always so hard anyways, made it even more difficult. Again, I, you know, I'd love to like in the book address climate change straight on, but I don't think that serves at least my third grade readers no. well for that book. I don't think it serves as well. Um, again, if you care about bears, then you can say, what can I do? You know, well, and, and you're building like, connections and that's yeah, the and key. It's scrumptiously beautiful. I mean, it's just, it's just a really gorgeous, gorgeous book. Well, I can't wait to see it. I know for me, Honeybee packed such, as you said, the emotional heat of that book is so strong. Um, you got all the facts packed in. I mean, right. I knew the facts that you had embedded within it, but you do it in a way that each page turn, you're like, is, is the bee going to make it? Is she going to be able to go fly? She's and then you've got it, that yeah. point where the bee dies and it's a natural yeah. part of the life cycle. And as she dies, a new bee is born, right. but it packs so much emotional heat. The facts are great. And the illustrations are just beautiful. I yeah. mean, they're so it's accurate. Just gorgeous. It's really, I'm like, it's too bad. I don't have one sitting here. So I'd hold it up and show it to you. So how is it collaborating with Eric? <laughs> it's easy. He's really easy. Um, Here's what we do. I kind of write my 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 text and then I send it upstairs to the studio and he, <laughs> he does his illustrations and then um, we will come back and we'll look at words and pictures together, um, decide what words need to go or um, often once we put the words, once you see the words on the picture, you realize it's a little too texty. And these are text heavy books anyway, I realize that. But even, even now you get a text heavy one, you go, oh, that's, you know, <laughs> that's too, too heavy. So we'll, we'll do that together and we'll look at it and um, change a few words or I'll make some suggestions um, illustrative wise, although I, I don't do that too often because he's usually right. Um, and yeah, yes, he just is. And um, yeah, it's it's actually really easy. It's really easy. I know we had we served out a panel not too long ago where where the title was we wrote a book together and we survived. And I thought, yeah, we, it's not too tough. It's actually really fun because I know that one, I'm getting a really great illustrator, but I know I'm going to have somebody that listens, um, listens that we listen to each other and value each other's opinions. Um, and that that really makes the project much so much better and easier that sounds wonderful yeah we're going to take a quick break and when we come back we're going to learn how author candace fleming got her start in storytelling Hey, early childhood and elementary school teachers and librarians, are you looking for ways to spice up your curriculum, build connections with engaged STEAM learners, and introduce multicultural versions of fairy tales and folk literature? If so, head over to drdianeadventures.com and check out our on-demand virtual course. 
Beyond Ever After STEAM on-demand virtual course allows you to work at your own pace and learn how to build these STEM STEAM connections through multicultural fairy tales and folk literature. You'll receive professional development credits after you complete this high-energy three-hour on-demand course produced with Steve Spangler, Inc. As a bonus, you're going to receive a PDF that's filled with curriculum connections and program ideas you can put to work immediately in your early childhood elementary or library setting. Discounts are available for group purchases, plus you get special pricing when you purchase it as part of a regular professional development workshop. So head on over to drdianeadventures.com and get started on your own Beyond Ever After experience. So let's move back just a little bit. I had read an interesting story about um, how you entered into storytelling as a preschooler. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Because I thought it was just a great story as a former preschool teacher myself. You mean my I'm a liar story? Uh It's a great story. All right. So um, when I was a kid, very young, um, I discovered that people would believe me if I told my stories, one, with real confidence, but two, with a lot of detail, right? So um, I told people like in kindergarten, I had a series of stories that I told about my three-legged cat named Spot and the adventures that we had in my backyard with like tigers and bears and snakes <laughs> and, um, in, in Northern Indiana. And it's basically a bedroom community of Chicago. So yeah. Um, but I was talking to my friends in kindergarten, so they they actually believed me. And um, of course, when they came over, they would learn that I didn't have um, tigers or bears or snakes in my backyard. How disappointing. Um, How disappointing. Well, then even worse, I don't have a three-legged cat. In fact, I don't have a cat. Um, (laughs) And so, you know, there were years where people would go, oh, Candy's a fibber, right? Um, I had a second grade teacher, Miss Johnson. um, And I told her that we went to Um, Paris, France for the long weekend or vacation weekend, probably was like Columbus Day or something. I told her we went to Paris and I had told her that we ate a lot of French bread and we had a lot of pastries and we went to the top of the Eiffel Tower and my father had bought me a new yellow hat and it blew away. You can tell what I was reading at the time, Madeline. Mm -hmm. Um, But I told it with so many details, like that hat blew off while we were at the Eiffel Tower and my dad bought me a new one that she actually believed those, that story. And she called my parents and wanted, um, photographs of our trip to Paris, France. So the other second graders could learn about Paris, France. And of course my mother, I can't imagine it, you know, I could get my rotor phone, right? Cause it's the seventies. Um, you know, I didn't know you went to Paris, France and my mother going, she did it. We did it. You know, can you tell <laughs> another story? Um, and you would think that, that everybody would have been really mad, but in fact, they really, all of them, including Miss Johnson really encouraged me to tell those stories. Um, I got a little older. I was able to write them down that, you know, that the, the head and the hand went almost the same speed. And um, I was really encouraged to write them down. So I had teachers after that, that knew I was writing those crazy stories and would ask me to share them with the class. Um, They would ask me what I was working on right now. So they were really treating me like a writer. Um, And so you know, I had that reputation as a fibber, but really I was just a storyteller. And that's what Miss Johnson, you know, you know, Candy's not a fibber. She's a storyteller and write them down. Or if you're going to tell me a story, just tell me it's a story. You know, how would you encourage other storytellers today? Tell those stories. Yeah. I would say no, no, slow it down. I, you know, I work with a lot of like fourth and fifth graders, or I have been recently. And um, I think it's fascinating that fourth and fifth grade, um, so it's like suddenly they've, they've, you can, you can get first and second graders to play, right? You can get them to tell you a story and you can write it down for them so that they don't feel um, completely um, um, terrified by the fact that they actually have to create words and sentences you know, if you just toss the conventions and go, you tell me a story and I'll write it down. They can create astonishing stories. Um, by fourth and fifth grade, it's just like suddenly I keep saying to them, we're just going to play. Right. And they're so worried about what it looks like on that page. 
So I, you know, I'm all about just tell me a story and you don't have to write it down. You don't have to finish it. You don't have to start it from beginning and work to the end. And not everything that you write down or you tell has to be a project. It's not to be turned in. I always call it just taking a few sentences out for a walk. Just oh, I like that. Sentences out for a walk. It doesn't matter. Just play around with the language. It doesn't have to be something that needs to be assessed or graded or turned in, right? And so. playful learning is sometimes the best learning because then you're open to other things. And it's interesting how they've like by fourth or fifth grade, they've forgotten how to play or how to pretend. So I'm right. always going in and going, we're going to do this point of view. We're going to do an exercise with point of view. And first, I'm going to ask you to be like a, a poet describing the sunset and or the sunrise. And then I'm going to ask you to switch. And I'm going to ask you to be a vampire describing the sunrise, right? And really, I just want you to pretend. I want you to fall into those characters, be the vampire, be the poet, be the whatever. And it's amazing how really hard it, it is for them to just let go. Um, so, And I think that's where the importance of the arts in STEAM education comes in too, because when you can continue to keep the arts in, then you keep fostering that playful learning. As right. There. Right. And I love playful learning. I love that. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's like, let's just play around a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Um, So what brings you joy these days? Um, Hiking, traveling, since we're back to traveling. So we do a lot of traveling where we do a lot of hiking. Um, We just came back from a big trip. We're in Croatia where we went sailing. But that's what what brings me joy these days. And I, I do like being home with the dog. He's here in my office on the floor. Quiet. I've got two behind me and they're actually I know, behaving. Funny? It's like, oh, I hope no, no UPS guy turns up because you'll know he's here. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I like being at home. I like walking the dog. We've been going to the woods a lot right now. It's gorgeous in Chicago. It's fall. It's like one of the most beautiful autumns that we've had in a long time. Um, just sort of walking and being out in the, out in the world. That's, that's, it feels like I'm catching up for time. You know, it feels like we haven't been out in the world. That much. makes sense to me. Yeah. I'm, and I'm really looking forward there. Um, there's a conference. NCTE is next month. And um, I really, really, I'm really looking forward to that because I have so many friends that I see at that conference or I used to see that I haven't seen in years. Right. Right. And I know I should be way more interested in those panels and what I'm going to say. But, you know, my focus is definitely on sing friends and well reconnecting with other people is a huge part of being human right and right. we've missed that the last couple of years we really have yeah i'm hungry for that so yeah that and being out in the world the absolutely world, going someplace seeing something doing something now new experiencing something so so you have polar bear coming out and you had the um crash from outer space that just came out are there any right. other books that are due for publication soon um, last March, I had uh, YA nonfiction come out called Murder Among Friends, which has gotten five starred reviews. So um, what have I got next year? Oh, I've got a, I've got two preschool stories. One is called Mine and um, Eric illustrated it. Um, and it's definitely solidly preschool and it rhyming. And we have, and I have this one here because I have an F, I got an F and G. It's the colors are wrong, but, um, and then we have this one with Simon, with Caitlin DeLuy at Simon Schuster called Penny and Pip. And it's the first in a series. Look how cute. Oh, it's beautiful. Isn't she adorable? And so is Pip, Penny, Pip, um, preschooler who goes to the Museum of Natural History and, um, uh, notices a dinosaur egg that hatches. And so she has a baby dinosaur, um, Pip. And of course, everyone else is extinct. So he has oh. no family, but he does have um, Penny. Penny. And so Penny will take care of him. And so we see this as a series. Penny will be the mothering. The And there's very few, there are no adults. They're there, but we just never see them. So it's always Penny and Pip's perspective oh I love that and I love dinosaurs and I love preschool right we yes. have some love in preschool and I you know I'm I think a lot about delight lately I mean it's something I've really maybe it's because 
I'm in sort of an undelightful project, but um, I really think sometimes, especially lately, I think that we've forgotten about delight. We're so busy being important and relevant that we've forgotten about how relevant and important just being delightful actually is, Um, not just in what we give kids, but I think in what we create as well. So it's something I've, I've just been mulling. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I love the fact that you managed to convey a sense of delight and curiosity in all that you write. Thanks. So thank you so much for being on the show with us today. It has been such a delight to have you. And I look forward to seeing the new books. Yeah, great. Thanks, Diane. Thank you. You've been listening to the Adventures in Learning podcast with your host, Dr. Diane. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe, download, and let us know what you think, and please tell a friend. If you want the full show notes and the pictures, please go to drdianeadventures.com. We look forward to you joining us on our next adventure.